Listen to the new Thin Green Line podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Game wardens John Norris and Wayne Saunders talk about wildlife, the outdoors, law enforcement, environmental subjects mixed with current events and guests that are part of the Thin Green Line. And if you are one of those visual people, like me, for $5 a month, you can see the actual podcast on Patreon.com. Just search the Thin Green Line podcast on Patreon.com and join us. We love our children. We protect them. We guide them. We prepare them for life in the world. With all that we do, from deep in our hearts, we cannot control all things. Life-threatening illnesses and disabilities affect far too many of our children each year. While we cannot change the circumstance, we can make dreams come true. Dreams to provide hope, to provide spiritual healing and strength, to provide moments of happiness and relief in the hardest of times. We can give a glimmer of light and hope in a time of darkness and despair. Join huntofalifetime.org to help make dreams come true, to provide hope for children with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Hunt of a Lifetime is a nonprofit organization fulfilling dreams for hunting and fishing trips to youth 21 and under with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Visit huntofalifetime.org to learn how you can make a difference. Please join me, Game Warden Wayne Saunders, and other Game Wardens on our adventures protecting wildlife, saving lives, and having fun, all while serving the public and the natural resources of our planet. Listen to the tales and experiences of those who work in the outdoors while being entertained with stories about encounters with poachers, wildlife investigation, murder investigation, near-death experiences, search and rescue missions, wildlife interactions from game wardens around the country and around the world. When I retired, I realized I couldn't let go of that legacy, but rather wanted to share the passion, the commitment, and the stories of those men and women that call themselves game wardens. This is Game Warden, Wayne Saunders, and this is Warden's Watch. Episode 55, the continuation of the Kate Matrasova search and rescue mission. But before we start with this podcast, just want to update you. John's not with me once again this week for this episode. He has been down in the border country. I hope he shares when he comes back what he's been up to. He's got some uh, pretty incredible things going on. And I want to update you guys on some really exciting stuff. And some of you on the social media platforms have probably seen a little change So we have a new addition to the Warden's Watch podcast crew, Morgan Day from Wisconsin. She's actually a student of conservation law, and she plans on being a Wisconsin game warden. And I have no doubt she will become a Wisconsin game warden. I must admit, I did try to recruit her for New Hampshire, so the colonel won't be disappointed that I tried. But her love certainly is for her state, and she certainly doesn't want to go anywhere else. But she's been a huge addition. She brings in a lot of knowledge on social media platforms, and she has been assisting in all aspects of Warden Swatch. But you will see on the social media front, we are trying to do some different things to to try to um, bring in more people, to touch more people. And one of the things we're going to be doing, and I'm really excited about it, so put this in your calendar, is a Patreon event, April 26th. John Norris and I will be live on Patreon. We will be doing that for our Patreon members. So for $5 a month, you can join Patreon and join us April 26, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we will be on uh, live with our Patreon members to get question and answers to talk about the podcasts, the Thin Green Line, Warden's Watch, and anything else that our members would like to talk about. Morgan will be there as well. She'll be pretty much running the show. So I'm pretty excited about that. That's something new we're bringing to Warden's Watch and the Thin Green Line is that live event. Also trying to create a revenue stream. Certainly podcasting can be a challenge at times. That is one reason we are doing that. So hopefully you'll help us out and participate because I think it's going to be exciting. I'm looking forward to it. So now, episode 55, Kate Matrasova. We're going to lead in with Lieutenant Mark Ober, who actually started the search and rescue mission on a Sunday six years ago in February when it was extremely cold and extremely windy. 
and he called me that night to just to tell me that he broke my cardinal rule to tell me that um, he thought this search was going to go into the next day. We're going to listen to Mark for a little bit, and then we're going to stop, and then we're going to bring in Conservation Officer Glenn Lucas is going to talk about his experience that first night, which is really eye-opening, and I really appreciate Glenn opening up to this. You're going to learn about a critical incident. You're going to learn about Glenn's critical incident. You're going to learn about decision-making, and you're going to learn about the right decisions that were made. And boy, especially being a supervisor in these search and rescue missions, risk assessment and taking risks and understanding risk assessment for both the rescuers and the victims. It's a balancing act. It's really tough on the search and rescue managers to put people in harm's way. And we have to rely on them. When they're on the ground, they know what's going on. They know what's going on with them. So this is a really uh, hard opening, a really uh, reflective reflective. And it reflected me because I did a lot of this podcasting recording last year and I kind of set it on the shelf and I I thought long and hard. And Glenn actually opens my eyes to probably why I let it sit there long and hard because maybe I didn't want to bring all this information up. Maybe I didn't want to revisit it. Maybe I wanted to leave it somewhere where I didn't have access to it, where I didn't have to think about it. But when you talk about critical incident training, we talked about, about getting those feelings out, just uh, flushing them. It's good for the soul. It's good to talk about it. And that's one thing. If you have a critical incident, to share it, to bottle it up inside isn't good. So if you find somebody that you can talk to, that's key. That's why we have counselors in everything from suicide to critical incidents to every walks of life, life that are people are trained to do this type of thing. And if you ever need it, don't be ashamed to reach out. That's one thing that the law enforcement world has started to change. And it's hard. It is very hard to go to counseling, that first step. But when you step out and you're done, wow, what a feeling. What a feeling to, to take a burden off of you. It's, uh, it's very special, and I'm very glad that people are accepting it. People are starting to understand what they're going through. And nobody's the same. We all deal with critical incidents, and we each have them in our lives Every one of us has a critical incident. And learning how to deal with those is, is good. It's good. Healthy people get help first. That's uh, my counselor. She uh, told me that. So healthy people get help first. Remember that. So don't be, don't be ashamed. And Glenn really opens himself up for whether it's criticism from his peers or uh, not being able to accomplish a mission. And we are grilled so much that we are invincible, that we have to complete the mission at all costs. And I think that's what we think we have to do to the point where we put ourselves in danger. Glenn made some decisions that night, the first night of the search and rescue on Kate Matrasova, and he shares them with you guys. And I hope we can all learn from those. I know I did. And I really appreciate him doing that. And we're going to end with Glenn's interview because I think it's so powerful that we have to contemplate on it. You got to think about it. You got to dwell on it. Listen to it twice. Uh, I think you can get something out of it because I certainly did. Thank you for listening to Warden's Watch. And please review us, leave a five-star review. That would be awesome. And again, join us April 26th. It was one of the craziest rescues I think we've ever done, our search and rescue missions. And unfortunately, it was more of a, it was a recovery. More of a search, too, initially. Yeah, and it had all kinds of twists and stuff and things we learned about those personal locator devices, which were insane at that time. Um, Just all the different locations it gave you that night and the continuing locations and, you know, just narrowing it down. One thing I learned about it is you cannot rely on them. No. Plain and simple. And, you know, we've always said you have to clear them, too. But how many points did we have? I mean, Ty has it in his book, but it was over 20. Yeah, there was quite a few. And um, they were so random that once this, once we got, I got past the second one, it was just, I knew at that point that there's no way we'd find her. Because that night, anyway. That night. Yeah. Because yeah. the first one came in. I think the first one, if I remember correctly, was, was where she was. Mm, absolutely. But yeah, there's no, we couldn't get anyone up there right. that night because of the, the wind. Yeah, um, the second one was was lower, and that's the that's where I thought okay, it gave the impression she was moving. Right. 
So I'm like, okay, she was here initially, then she hiked down to that point. She's off trail, so we should be able to get her because yeah. kind of out of the wind and, and uh, kind of covered a little bit. But yeah. then, then after that, then we got a bunch more, and it was just all over the place. Right. And let, let's start from the beginning, Mark, okay. because, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I was off that day. It was a Sunday. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it seems like for yeah, most of the rescues, was I was off. The common <laughs> theme, Wayne was off. <laughs> And I, yeah, so you were off. Yeah. Uh, it was a cold, cold day. Um, and it was gaining, and it was predicted to be some serious, serious weather rolling in. Yeah, serious wind and, and cold. It wasn't wasn't snow. I don't think it was predicted for any snow. Just very windy, very cold. I remember covering a, a, at least one snow machine crash that day, which really, it was unbelievable they were out riding, because mm. it was a rental crash, of course. Of course. Um, so I cleared that, and... And most of the guys that were on, there was a few like Bob and Glenn were out patrolling or had just actually, I think they had just gone out for a snow machine patrol. Why? I don't know. Cause it was, it was below zero. Mm-hmm. And then Matt was kind of in the area. I was over, I was just clearing from the rental place in twin because to get the sheet uh, that were required to submit with our reports. Yes. <laughs> I just Signed picked that up. Page yep. that... So I just picked that up. So I was on 302 headed towards the like, center of town. And that's when I think, oh, what's her name? The dispatch for Troop F. Tenley? No, keep going. Megan. Okay. Uh, no, you know I what? I would have gone it, Kit first. It but. was no, it was <laughs> Megan and it wasn't her. It was the other kid who's who's not there anymore. Stevens? Maybe, um, yeah. Yeah. He's gone now. But I think they called me on my cell phone. I was trying to remember if they called me on the radio or cell, but I think they called me on my cell phone. And, and that's when they told me. And I, I just couldn't believe it. Yeah. Yeah, that's because you were looking outside of your window, and after you yeah. just been out there exposed yep. to get that call, uh, yeah, yep. and just knowing I've been there, but never to that extreme. I mean, yeah. what do you remember what the temperature was then? It was it was probably ten below. Ten below. Yep. Yeah, it was definitely and starting to build. You could tell ten, it was ten below, and, it, and this was uh, what three o'clock in the afternoon, maybe. Mm-hmm. So Sun's it, still out. Yep. Oh yeah, it's still still daylight, and there was a. Uh, the prediction was for it to get colder and the wind to pick up, and it hadn't. It wasn't there yet, but it was getting there. And uh, I just remember thinking, I know where that spot is, and I know mm. what it takes to get there. And it was it was it easy calls to make because you know you got to try. And in fact, I think one of my first calls was to uh, the colonel Marty, mm-hmm. and um, he's like, I'll. I'll you know, he wanted me to call. I think uh, Lieutenant Goss, and then I called Neil in too because he was the assistant. It's like I'll leave it up to you, but ultimately, I think, and again, I'm 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 going back in memory here. I want to say that he, the colonel said we got to at least try. It's like don't put anyone's lives in danger, but we've got to try. Yep. So that sealed it for for me that yeah we we're gonna send we we're gonna send them up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was uh, I'm sure there was a discussion there. Yeah, Jim, uh, Jim Goss. I don't remember much. Because I think he was on a day off too, but he called me back and we discussed it. And I would already made calls to MRS and the the rest or the and the uh, the few team guys, Matt, Glenn, and Bob that were going to go. And so he was just trying to find out details and stuff. And essentially, he's like, "Yeah, I hope you find her because if you don't, we'll be we'll be up tomorrow." Mm. And Neilan was a little bit more hesitant because he knew the conditions. He's like, "Yeah, it's like I don't know if I'd send guys, but if the colonel wants to try, we're going to try." Right. And you, you worked with Mountain Rescue Services then too, so I mean certainly what they had for input as well yes. was, was um, helpful, and A, they responded with you, so you called some officers and started organizing that night's search? Yeah, I called um, called Matt initially, I believe, and then and then I had uh, I left Do messages. Do you remember his response? Yeah, you got to be kidding me, I think, or it could have been a, another term he used, but <laughs> it was on Channel 2, so it got, yeah. it got recorded somewhere out there. Someone yeah. else heard it. Yeah. Technology. It was basically the same response when we podcasted. Yeah. So, you so he, was, me. he was, yeah, he was like in shock. Yep. And um, I think I had to page, have Glenn and Bob paged because they were out on snowmobile. Mm-hmm. And they, they sort of, when they eventually, when they got the message, they called called me and when they couldn't, essentially said the same thing. You got to be kidding. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And then I, I called. Um, Wilcox. Yeah, Rick. Rick Wilcox. So I called Rick directly. Um, that was, I think, and I Rick. podcasted with Rick. Okay, so that was recommended from from Mark from the Colonel. He yep. said call Rick call directly, Rick. and then Rick made the calls to the the teams that he wanted. So he he took care of that for me, 
as far as getting, I don't know if he handpicked this cruise or if, or if it was just a general call out. I'm not sure, but right. The the groups, the two different teams that showed up were. I'm sure you and Rick had a discussion about the weather yep. and everything like that. Yeah, and I told him, uh, in a, essentially, I kind of knew that if 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 it was only that one spot, the first spot beacon mm-hmm. sh- that showed up where it was, we both agreed that it would at that time. By the time anyone got up there, it would be well after dark. The winds would be at their peak, increased, yep. and there was no way we could risk rescuers. It just everyone would lives would be put in danger. But at that point, the second beacon had come in, which was lower down on the side of Madison. Yep. In the tree line. In the tree line. And um, and that was a little bit more believable of what she would have been doing. Mm-hmm. And so that was, that was okay, that's, it's still crappy up there, but that's a reasonable goal to, and we could definitely do that. Right. So that's what we were counting on. Mm-hmm. So hopefully she had... St- Started, deployed her beacon, and then in the process coming off the mountain, yep. sent another signal out, and yep. hopefully she was below the tree line. Yep. No, that's 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 a reasonable thing to think and, you know, to get teams all set up and to go. And the officer's team was the first there and to respond, the first to gear up. Yeah, um, it was, well, it was Matt, Bob, and, and Glenn. And I, I don't remember. I think they all went up together. They did. They were the first ones there. Um, it, by this time, it was probably six o'clock because it takes time. Mm-hmm. You can't just run. You know. Yeah, by the time everybody gets home, gets their gear. Yeah, I don't think anyone went home because they carry their gear yeah. in their cruisers. Yeah, no, yeah, no one went home. I know they went to Randolph Fire Department to change because mm-hmm. else you're changing out in negative ten. Right outside your cruiser, you start cold. in the parking lot. They went there to change into their gear, and then um, I want to say. Probably Glenn. One of them took their snow, tried to take the snow machine up the trail as far as they could, mm-hmm. which was wasn't very far, but it helped. You know, it, yeah, a little bit of every little bit helps. Little we, bit helps. We, we found that out <laughs> in search and rescue. Um, whether it's an ATV or a snowmobile, that yep. every little bit helps. And so these guys got, they you know, seventy five, eighty, eighty pound packs with all their gear, mm. and they're hiking up this this trail. It's a four and a half mile hike, I believe, one way, and then. Um, so that they they start up after dark. You remember the temperatures then when you did send it out deploying yeah. these guys? I know it's it's, it's in it, the report. <laughs> yeah, it's in the report. It, it's I know it it not counting wind chill. I, I want to say up on the up on the summit it was forty or fifty below. Mm-hmm. Not counting wind. I think with not the counting. wind chill it was ninety below. Yeah, I want to say down in the parking lot where I was, all nice and warm in my cruiser. Mm-hmm. It was it was slowly getting there. It was ten and then fifteen, and I think it, it it didn't get much lower than that down there. But I, I remember stepping out a few times, and it was absolutely just frigid. Yeah, yep. get cold instantly. Yep. So those guys are are heading up, and not not long after the first crew of MRS showed up and gave them the debrief. I think Steve was on. Yeah, Steve was definitely in that group. Yep. Steve Dupuy. Steve, was Steve Dupuy, and now we, the president of yep. Is he still the president of MRS? He is, I believe. Yeah. There was four of them, I think. And when uh, Steve and I looked at the map, we looked at the beacons, and I think it was at that point in time where the third beacon came in. Uh-huh. When I was sitting, they were gearing up. We had the second beacon, which made sense, like we said, I said earlier, she's mm-hmm. moving. But then the third one showed up, which mm-hmm. was over in King Ravine. Yeah. And I showed Steve that, and he's like, yeah, we're definitely not going there. Yeah. Avalanche danger, steep, you know, just wasn't happening. Right. So that's when we... And Essentially, these beacon points. I mean, from where it was to King Ravine, you're talking not even close. Yeah, you know, talking a mile. A mile. Yeah, yeah. The, the other one was, I think, a half a mile, or so, from the first one to the second one. I think it was somewhere around a half a mile. Mm-hmm. And then, but the other one was a mile from right. the third one was a mile from the second and one. Totally in the, a whole different area. Yeah, whole different area. Just not even not even accessible. Th- <laughs> wouldn't make sense. Yeah. Um. So at this point in time, I had this sneaking suspicion that. She wasn't at the point two, but that's the best. That's really the only place we could send anyone safely that night. Mm-hmm. Didn't know for sure, but so that's where we went. And so mm. we still decided to stick with the plan, even though the third one showed her, potentially showed her in a totally different area. Right. We went to point two. And that extreme cold gave our rescue teams a very difficult time, huh? Yeah. Glenn had to cut it short. Um, I'm sure you already told you yep. that uh, he wasn't feeling well and... Um, when in those sort of situations, if you don't feel well, you don't go because right. you cause more problems than, than help. And as a supervisor, we, we accept that. Yep. You know, we don't 
yeah. <laughs> give them any hard time or anything. No. They're on the ground. They're they're doing that. That's uh, you know well, certainly we can't put them in yeah. danger unnecessarily. And I wish we had taken some pictures of, or I had taken some pictures when these crews came down because every one of them just was was covered in frost and you know all their gear and they just looked miserable. Yeah, beat down, miserable, cold. So so different than most rescues. Yeah. I love seeing you look miserable on a few ones. <laughs> yeah. <My, laughs> yeah, but not on those. Because what people don't understand, when the, when the lieutenant's working, the sergeant actually has to hike. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which I, I, I kind of miss those days sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And when the lieutenant's yeah. on, he gets to sit in the truck all the time. So. Um, which is good and bad, yeah. uh, no, and the, no doubt. And the one thing I remember about this, and, and I don't mind being second-guessed, but sometimes you people go overboard with their concerns, and there was some concern that I let Glenn come down by himself and continued Matt. You know, Glenn, uh, Matt yeah. and Bob continued on. I'm like, I knew there was a crew coming up right behind him. Right. So if, there was, if they're coming down, I, I don't have an issue with that. Yeah. So. No, but whatever. And, and you, you got to make your we decisions. Get, we make and, our decisions and get criticized for yeah, it, and I, I stand I, by I, it. Absolutely. But, no, but um, I stand by you on that, too, especially where you had another team coming up through that can yeah. check on him. Yep. And I had radio contact. And mm-hmm. It's just he's on the trail. He's coming down. Yep. It's fine. Nope. The I other two. I would the same one myself. Interview with conservation officer Glenn Lucas. So I started this project, uh, and I interviewed Ty Gagne, who wrote the book about Kate Matrasova, Glenn, and... You know, I think of all my career, the search and rescues I've done, the ones that stick with me the most, and it's uh, with the Kate, how can you not have that stick with you? Because it was probably the most extreme search and rescue mission we have ever done, and hopefully ever will, to be honest with you, because I think we, we went on the points of, uh, yeah, the, the, the brim of where we should be. You were there initially you called. You were there suited up. You were there. I was there the next day. Still extreme, but not 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 what you guys experienced. And I just remember the wind blowing across when Mark wanted to put the the command post in the, the parking lot, and the wind blew, and you could not see. And it was and he says to me, looks at me, goes, "So I don't think we should do it here." <laughs> and I'm like, "Nah, I guess not." And then we moved to the fire department, which I think was a better better case, anyways. But can, can you go through that night? And I'll try not to interject in there because. Uh, oh, it, please do. I- yeah, that was um <clears throat> yeah, February 2015. It was uh yeah, it was a lo- a night that I'll definitely never forget, not to be cliché about it, but the thing that really brought it to light for me was Ty Gagney doing the book. You know, mm. I mean, I it's definitely not a forgettable night, but you know, months went by. I don't remember when Ty interviewed us, but you know, months went by and you don't forget about it, but I think with any I'm going to go out on a limb traumatic event, you know, whether it's trauma from the family you're trying to rescue or trauma within, you know, mm-hmm. dealing with a really bad situation, you you try to forget some of it. Mm-hmm. And when Ty came and interviewed me, I actually answered a lot of questions that I had inside that I never asked myself. They were there. Um so it was it was actually a a life changer for me. Yes, that night, but actually a while later when Ty interviewed me. Um so it's 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 made a big difference and big impact on my life. But that afternoon, it was a Sunday. I had this great idea of going snowmobiling on a on that cold day. It was I don't want to misquote it, but it was it was below. It was colder than fifteen below zero. I think it was twenty below. It was it was bad. Mm. I remember putting on specific boots my parents bought me when I got hired because my mom was obviously worried about my little feet. So I wore those special boots that I never wore my whole career. They're they're. Uh, really good boots i decided to meet up with bob who bordered my my district so i'm snowmobiling down and um i hear in the radio he's calling and he's got the different tone it's not like hey where are you he's calling me because something's going on so i stop my sled and i call him on the phone he says where are you we got a rescue and you know i'm like a rescue it's 20 below zero like you're kidding me right you know Mm. we joke a lot he's like no i'm i'm not kidding i need to pick you up my truck and trailer bring it to your house and we got to go and i remember just kind of taking a second going this is not good <clears throat> so he picked me up in a trailer and brought me to my house which was on the way to to the presidential range and that's very uncommon i mean the, the lieutenant just picked you up or the sergeant just picked you up with his truck and trailer yeah. oh it was bob uh, mancini no it was bob oh, Bob picked you yeah up. okay so he had it arranged so you could get picked up the sergeant arranged it you need to pick lucas up because time is of the essence and i remember thinking i'll just snowmobile home what's the big no no mm. it was time so he picked me up and uh, you know, usually you're getting ready for rescue. You don't 
not rush, but you get your stuff ready. And Bob is like, I'm going to drop you off and get going. And I'm thinking, okay. You know, I heard some of the things where what it was, a single person was hiking and a distress signal went out. Very common. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd been on the advanced search and rescue team for quite a few years at that point, done some serious ones that were potentially life-altering for me. Um, But this seemed a little more extreme as far as weather goes. So I remember going in and I think my wife thought I was kidding as well. She's like, oh, you're back early. And I'm like, yeah, I got to go on a rescue. And she just had that look like, please tell me you're kidding. You know, Mm. and I'm like, and she could see it on my face. Like I could hear it in Bob's voice. I I wasn't kidding. We had uh, only one son at that time. And she went into game worn wife mode. What do you need? What can I do? Um, what can I get ready? What do you need? You know, and it was business. I went downstairs, got my special. Even your gear. wife recognizes how serious this is. Yeah, it was, um, <clears throat> you know, which is really humbling because, you know, I got a little kid at the time, 20, he would have been uh, a month old. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> yeah, it was, uh, no, I'm sorry, a year and a month. A year and a month. Almost, yeah. I went downstairs, I got all my gear ready. I came up and she had, you know, hot water and Nalgene bottles, hot chocolate, you know, lunches, snacks, everything I needed, excuse me, to, you know, stay the night in the mountain because it's already in the afternoon. I don't remember the time, two o'clock or something. Get all my gear together. I'm not an, a guy of avoidance, but it was that, I uh, just act like everything else every other time. Love you, honey. I'll see you tonight or in the morning. You know, it wasn't, don't hug your wife for the last time. It was, I'm going to do a job that I do all the time, honey. It's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. I think it was to protect her, but subconsciously it was to protect me too because I didn't want to think this is bad. Mm -hmm. So I get my truck and I head over, uh, truck and trailer, because I loaded my snowmobile up. And I get there and it's it's, uh, CO Matt Holmes, uh, CO Mancini, and then Sergeant uh, Mark Ober. And again, look on Mark's, and we were pulling the parking lot and it is bad. I mean, like, I don't want to be outside. And now Mm -hmm. we got to de-gear out of our warm clothes and warm cruiser and get in, you know, rescue gear. So we're in Randolph at Appalachia parking lot. We go down to uh, Randolph Fire Department. And again, the fire department's really good to us. So we have a key, we get in, and we can get suited up out of the weather. It wasn't like a normal preparation rescue time. Normally, you, you don't really joke, but you razz each other and, ah, this will be good. We'll find them. We know where they are. And, you know, who's bringing the hot chocolate? This was who has what, who's bringing what, and what is everyone's task in this bad situation Mm -hmm. you know we knew she was up there alone we knew that her position for the gps coordinates had changed multiple times which is bad for us because that Mm -hmm. means it's not you know 100 percent positive and you know we're already thinking is this rescue or recovery what motivates me and of course mostly the team is is um i don't care if we get told it's a recovery there's always a chance you know unless unless someone's on the scene saying they're not breathing and dead mm-hmm. it's it's a rescue that's what yeah, we are search absolutely. and rescue mm-hmm. we double checked each other usually you know we've been doing it a long time bob bob was relatively new to this to the team matt's a leader on the team as far as a tenure so we we looked to matt double checking i made a really big mistake that night getting ready i dressed normal when i just wear i just wore a thermal layer and then my outer layers, because I don't hike really fast, but we have 70 pound pack, you know, you're geared up, you're going to sweat, you can't mm. layer up. I made the mistake of treating that night as a normal rescue night in the winter, you know, not extra layers. I had them with me. So we snowmobiled in a little ways to save some time. And then we start hiking. And, and we talk about a normal search and rescue. We're talking temperatures. <laughs> Still not normal. Yeah. yeah. Negative 10 yeah. and above probably. Yeah. I mean, um, Anything to me, winds, you know, if it's around zero and winds are up to 50, I would consider that pushing the limit, but not that bad. Mm-hmm. And I'm not trying to be grandiose. Uh, you know, I'm not a, a winter mountaineer as, as much as, you know, some of our volunteers, which are top notch. Mm. You know, we do the job and do it the best of our ability, but I don't do it every day. And that was another thing that hit me, which I'll touch on later, is just the, you know, the preparedness that we don't have all the time. So we snowmobiled in and we got going and hiking up. And I just remember thinking, I cannot get warm. My fingers were freezing. I had heat packs. My chest was cold. My legs were freezing. You know, so you just push harder. You try to hike a little faster, or move mm-hmm. your arms or, you know, take a higher step and wiggle your toes. And I don't remember how far up we went, but we went more than a mile, mile and a half. I don't know, two miles. It was a ways. And you guys have top-notch equipment. You have the best equipment that, yeah. that, that you can get. 
Yeah, I mean, we have really good stuff. Um, the department trees us well. We get donations. I mean, there's some things that, that work in our favor, but there's always the human element, and, mm -hmm. and I didn't make a great choice, and I reflected on these choices when Ty talked to me, and it, I mean, be humble about it, but it, uh, it, it was, uh, it was hard for me to accept that I made some mistakes, mm -hmm. you know? So we started going up and, and I start, my body started shutting down. I started cramping in my, in my quads and my, t my toes were so cold and I had, I had good gear on it. Coflax, hard plastic boots. How far into the, 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 the mission are you? It had to be a mile and a half up or so. I mean, it was mm -hmm. it was a ways, but when you look at the map, it's embarrassing because you're like, "That's all you did," you know. Mm -hmm. It's it's embarrassing, which I you know, I'd, uh, hopefully other people learn from my mistakes, but I definitely learn from them. I can tell you that I I do things differently now. But a ways in, I started to shut down, and I remember thinking, just at the bottom, we went from business to serious business. And I started realizing, okay, this is a rescue mission. Still, we're gonna find her, which is a motivator. We're a team of three. We don't stay. No one goes alone in a winter rescue. Mm -hmm. Well, with a team of three, and I'm as I'm trying to push through the cramps and hike through them, which I've done so many times in the past. You just grin and bear it, and then the cramp works through, and you good to go. Yep, all stretched out. Yeah, it like didn't, it or not, it didn't work, and I kept mm -hmm. pushing, and I started slowing down. To the point where either Bob or Matt came back down, like, you good? I'm like, you know, and I'm at the decision mode. Mm. And I realized, well, if I'm going to stay, they're going to want to stay with me, which is unacceptable. I, they need to continue. This team, we're the only ones up there. We got other rescuers coming, but it's a ways out. I realized that I needed to convince the other two that they needed to leave me. Not to die. <laughs> but you're at a lower point where you can bail and be yeah. safe. Yeah, that bailout point is there. It's decision time for, for Glenn. And, and mm -hmm. uh, Matt and Bob came back down, and, and I told them, guys, I cannot do this anymore. I realized that I became a liability to the team, and they didn't want to hear any part of it. Bob being Bob, no, nope, push through it. We can do it. I'm like, Bob, I'm telling you right now, if I go any further and become an issue, then the mission's done, and that's my fault. I'm not doing that. And it took some convincing. Bob can And then – I never forget as we're standing there talking, then they start to have problems because they're not moving. Mm. So then there, you know, I remember I, I got Bob, I got to go. I, I got to get more. Okay, Bob, you start even. So he's doing ups and backs trying to stay warm. Matt was really good. And Matt's like, let's get you in a bivy bag. Let's get you warm and you stay here and we'll go do the best we can. Okay, good. So I take, I couldn't unzip my jacket. I couldn't do it. I could not get it. And Matt had to unzip my jacket. I remember thinking, this is a good decision because I'm bad. Mm. Matt got me in my bivy bag. He got me set up against the tree, you know, insulative layer off the ground. And I'm, I'm into that hypothermia where I'm not making good decisions. Mm. I, you know, I'm lost mobility. I, you know, I think I'm making the right decision. But so they, I'm not even going to say the, the term leave me. They decide to let me do my own thing. You stay here. Other volunteers are coming, Glenn, so you're not going to be here alone for long, which <laughs> it felt like a long time. They continue up. Now I'm in, I save my light. I'm in the complete darkness on the side of a snowshoe hiking trail on a mountain. And I just remember getting colder and colder and colder and laying it up against this tree. And it sounds like a, a movie, but I'm thinking to myself, this is how I find people dead against a tree. You know, they pushed themselves too far. They made mm -hmm. bad decisions. And here I am, I'm going to become a statistic in the White Mountains like I've been on the last 15 on that long list of deaths in the Whites. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, you need to get up. And now I'm talking to myself. And then I realize, I'm why are you talking to yourself? You know, like it's, mm -hmm. you're, we know we've seen it. We've mm -hmm. seen the bad. We've seen the hypothermic. We've seen the poor decisions. We've, and I'm realizing, okay, Glenn, stop talking to yourself, but you need to get your rear end up now. Because I remember, so I... I got out of the bivy bag. I stuffed the, this, this bivy bag, which is just a thin sleeping bag to keep the weather out. And, and I started drag. Literally, I felt like peg legs. I just thumping my way down the mountain to move because I didn't want to die there. And that's mm -hmm. all I can think of is my, my son at home and my wife thinks, you know, it just got, it got really emotional for me on the side of the mountain. Down I went. I went, started going down the mountain. I started to feel a little warmer. And I think it's that mentality of all I could think of is my, my patrol truck. I want to get in my truck, the safety of my truck. I want to get out of the wind. I want the heat on. I got to get off this mountain. And then here comes the, the volunteer rescue group. 
these men and women do this stuff every day. Mm -hmm. They are good. They are way better than I'll ever be. You know, and I'm not, we're good. Mm -hmm. We do our job, we do it well, but I don't, I don't hike every day. Right. You're not a winter guide on Mount, you know, the (sighs) presidential range. No. And that's what these people do. These men and women are out there all the time. Mm Mm-hmm. The volunteer from Maine who's... Um, Steve Dupuy. Steve Dupuy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sorry, Steve, forgot your name. But here comes Steve first in this volunteer group, and he goes, again, the look in his face, he's like, you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And he goes, no, you're not. And he, he's a very, you know, you're going to say it as it is. And he goes, someone needs to go down with you, Glenn. I said, no, I'm fine, Steve. And he, he kind of grabbed me, and he's like, Glenn, you are not good. I said, Steve... All I need to do is keep moving. Please don't stop me from moving. He, and I didn't see my, I can look at myself. Yeah. I convinced him to let me go along because another group was coming up. So I, I said, I just need to go. Let, let me go down. <laughs> so I continued down, got to my snowmobile, started up my snowmobile, rode to the cruiser. I remember sitting in that cruise, you know, getting some gear off. And Mark was at the cruiser. And I, I think he was a little disappointed with me, which is rightfully so. You know, I, I, I should have done better, and I didn't. And I remember sitting in my cruiser feeling just such relief that I made it back to the road alive because I just, I don't know, a lot of things didn't go my way, and some of it was my fault. Well, most of it was my fault, I guess. But, you know, Mother Nature beat me that one, that's for sure. And um, But we're talking temperatures that got down that night to negative 90 with the wind chill. Yeah. It's the second coldest place <laughs> In the world, next to Antarctica. Yeah, it was it was the worst I ever experienced in my life. I think the ambient temperature was forty below or something, thirty mm. something. It was yeah, that's high. without wind chill. Without wind chill, yeah, without wind chill. Yeah, with yeah. just standing there in a bubble. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then with the wind, it was it was awful. I think it was a lack of choosing the right gear. Was it fortitude? I I don't know. I, you know, it's a lot of things there. But to get back around to a lot of things I realized when getting interviewed by Ty, you know, there's a little reluctance to share a weakness, you know, any game warden, man or woman, you know, you don't want to show signs of weakness. That's mm-hmm. not what we do. We, we right. promote drive and, and strength, professionalism and strength. And, We're the rescuer. Yeah. Yeah. You don't get rescued. And uh, so it, it was, it's still embarrassing for me, but I believe that my mom always taught you got to be humble about stuff. And if, if the truth hurts, you still got to say it. You know, and if it, maybe it helps someone else that's on a rescue, you know, exactly. that believes that they can save someone's life and you can't put your own in jeopardy or what was more important to me and not to be cavalier whatsoever. The team was more important to me at that point. I knew they needed to keep going and I needed to stay. Mm-hmm. And I think if, you know, a rescuer can make that decision like I did or a different one or better one, then, then I made a difference. But when Ty interviewed me and got, he, he was, I never, he's like, can I write this down? Can can I put this in the book? And I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't be telling you if I wasn't right. okay with it. He was shocked that I was willing to share my weaknesses with the public. Just what we talked about. Yeah, yeah I'm willing to do it. But the, <laughs> the, the part that really came around for me was one opening up for, for Ty and sharing that information. But months later, he wrote his book, mm-hmm. uh, Where You'll Find Me. And um, of course, he gave me a signed copy. And I... <laughs> I never forget. He gave it to it. Did you hand it out, or was it Mark? It was handed out at a district meeting. I think he sent him up. And you yeah. did, it must. Did you work with Jim Sears, or did you retire before? No, I worked with Jim. Okay, yeah. so you must have handed him out because it was a first, Jim Sears' first district meeting, and you handed him out. And I remember being a warden. Like I'm not going to read that flipping book, <laughs> right? Like I did it. I don't need to read it, right? And Jim Sears, who's who's a more of a mountaineer. That, I think that was my quote to Tide, too. <laughs> I lived it. I don't have to read it. Yeah. <laughs> and this is, Jim wanted to read it. Oh, I heard about it because she was not on the job when that happened. Mm-hmm. And Jim was all excited. So what did I do? Here you go, Jim. Give it back to me when you're done. I wanted nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. I didn't know why I did that until later. Hand it to Jim. Yeah, it's signed to, signed to me, Jim, by Ty. But just read the book. I don't, I don't really care. Well, couple months later ty calls me hey i want to do this um you know book signing thing to promote the department and the book and you know i'd really like you come down and be my guest speaker and i'm like um well uh i gotta be honest ty i never read the book and he the poor guy he he was probably devastated and i was embarrassed but i told him the truth and he's like oh you haven't nope i haven't he's like um do you mind reading it 
<laughs> yeah, I'll have to get it back from the guy I gave it to. <laughs> so uh, I uh, I got the book from Jim. No, I, correction. I went to see Mancini. Actually, he was, at that time, he had left. He had been, the, he's a, he was a Sugar Hill chief at the time. Mm. So I went to see Bob. And um, we got talking. I said, Ty's asked me to do this. And, uh, and he's like, oh, did you read it? No, Bob, I haven't read it. He goes, are you kidding me? You got to read the book. So I had some time. And I was hanging out with Bob, and I said, well, do you have your book? Yeah, I got it. So he had to run somewhere, and I, we were, I was helping him with some project at his house. But anyways, I started to read the book at Bob's house, and I couldn't stop. And it was, I think it was literally like four days before this book signing. Mm-hmm. So I started to read the book, and then I had to go home. And at, the, and then, and at that time, I had two kids, so I go home. I leave. I take Bob's book, because I already gave mine away. Right. I take Bob's book home get the kids in bed and I read the book till three in the morning. I finished the whole book that day because I can't put it down. His, his style, the way that he organized them. I couldn't, I couldn't put it down and I finished it. I realized why I never read it. And it opened up a lot of feelings for me. And we've discussed one specifically, which I'm sure we'll talk about before the end. But I think in me, I don't, I know it's just not just me as a warden, but any, first responder that deals with horrible things is I think most of the time we distance ourselves. We deal with it enough to be um, safe mentally and, and safe dealing with people. And we can talk about it in comfort level. You get to that point where you can distance yourself, but know enough and you move on. And I realized that I did not want to have any connection to Kate Matrasova more than I already had. And so I just knew enough about the story and I dealt with it and I moved on. Mm-hmm. When I read that book, it it gave me a connection to Kate, and I realized just that. This is why I don't read the books about situations, because I did it. I don't mm-hmm. need to do this anymore. But I, I, I felt a connection to Kate because it was so well written, and you just learned so much about who she was and what she did and why she did it. And then, then the questions of why did she do that? Why didn't she do this? And what I could have done different? And and, and I talked at the beginning that all these things, you, all these questions come up to yourself. I'm sure I had those questions the rescue day or the next day, and right. I just never answered them. I just put them away. Yep. And after reading the book, I answered a lot of them, and I realized why I don't get involved with after the report's done, I'm done, and I'm moving on. And as far as mental health goes, you know, Ty really opened my eyes that dealing with it and Finding out more, if you truly want to find out more, is important. Yeah, I it was it was that was a rough night, and reading other people's parts that you never know about. You know, I kept being drawn to the rescue crew that was guiding on the other side. I think the Amanusik River Valley, or right. you know, that came up and they he he said we can't go any further, and they wanted to go further. And I'm pretty sure he came and then helped rescue. Right? Wasn't he part of the rescuers? Like, you know, it's they just came back. Yeah, you never know all this other part that people give and 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 volunteer and it's more than just your little part of doing the best you can or or not doing the best you can but some other so going forward i went to the book signing and it was really good i i felt good about it almost therapeutic yeah it was exactly therapeutic it's what i needed you know to really be self-aware of why i do certain things and why i don't do certain things right someone asked a question and it was really embarrassing to answer but it was the truth they asked, well, do you believe that you could have been um, in better shape or prepared yourself better for that rescue? Yeah. That's always a yes. Yeah. No matter what kind of shape. For- and that's and that's where the law enforcement side comes in. In the police academy, uh, I think it was Lieutenant Bowler at the time, there's no such thing as too good a shape. Mm-hmm. Could I have been in better shape? Absolutely. Was I in the best shape I could have been in? There's no such thing. No. Nope. Could I have made better you know, decisions with my gear? Absolutely. Mm. You know, so I think it was important for me to do it, but also, you know, to give respect to to Kate and her her husband that, you know, she lost her life and we tried our best, did the best we could. Our best wasn't good enough because some things had already happened that was out of our control. You know, another thing that came into question and you mentioned at the beginning was from your side of managing, we got told to go. Mm -hmm. I never thought of it that night. It was outrageously cold and I didn't want to go, but it never crossed the line of, I'm not going. You can't tell me to go. It never entered my mind until 
reading that book and realizing how bad it was, I remember thinking, wait a minute, can we, sh- can we say no? You know, like it brought up the question of like, if a supervisor tell you, you will go, you're going to go. But I remember talking to Mark later, or maybe it was you, is, you know, we had this roundtable discussion of who has, the, who can make that decision, who can call it off. And I think it was you or Mark that said, at the base of the mountain, it's the supervisor's decision. You will go. When we get in the woods and we are the rescue team, the decision's ours. Absolutely. And there was, it answered the question and it, it felt really good because I, that was a decision I did make and do right by mm-hmm. listening to a supervisor. Yep, I'm going. And then I realized I did make that decision on the mountain that day. I did say, I can't do this. I won't do this. Not in subordination, but just, it was my choice. Right. So some people like, I can't believe you guys just sent up. That's, you know, that's negligent. No. No, it, it was a check and balance. We got sent up to do a task. We do it to the best of our ability. We decide what we can and can't do. And it was that it was that comforting feeling that, you know, work for a good department and we get treated the best and we're human beings and, you know, mistakes get made and you're not judged on them. You know? No. It, it was a tough one. You got to walk a mile in their shoes and uh, certainly a supervisor can't do that if he's not there. If, Rely on the people yeah. on the ground. Yeah, and and the radios were able to communicate. I told I, I coming down, and I remember Mark. You know, he was like, "Okay," you know. I'm I'm sure he was thinking, "Really?" But he never questioned me. He mm-hmm. never said, "No, you need to keep going," or "What's the problem?" You know, mm-hmm. it was hesitance of okay, but it was my decision, and it was a really hard one, and it was hard to talk about. And now I can't drive by that trailhead without thinking of Kate. Mm-hmm. And I hike that trail a lot in the summer and fall tw- every season. <laughs> and I think of Kate. She's really the first one that I made a connection with. And it is um, it has changed me for the better. And, and I think it's important, like you said, that, you know, for remembrance of her and her family, you know, she's, uh, I think she still stays with a lot of us. Yeah, she does. And I think we got to take all the good we can out of the bad regardless. Yeah. But, no, thanks for sharing your story, Glenn. Thank you. Please join me, Game Warden Wayne Saunders, and other Game Wardens on our adventures protecting wildlife, saving lives, and having fun, all while serving the public and the natural resources of our planet. Listen to the tales and experiences of those who work in the outdoors while being entertained with stories about encounters with poachers, wildlife investigation, murder investigation, near-death experiences, search and rescue missions, wildlife interactions from Game Wardens around the country and around the world. When I retired, I realized I couldn't let go of that legacy, but rather wanted to share the passion, the commitment, and the stories of those men and women that call themselves Game Wardens. This is Game Warden, Wayne Saunders, and this is Warden's Watch.